Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word for our consideration this morning, Psalm 87. The city he founded is on the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwellings of Jacob. Interlude. Glorious things are spoken about you, O city of God. I will register Rahab and Babylon among those who know me. Look, Philistia and Tyre are there, along with Cush. Of them I say, this one was born, there in Zion. And about Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself will establish her. When he registers the peoples, the Lord will write, musical interlude, this one was born there. Then the singers, as they dance, will sing, all my springs are in you. The word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, does it ever just boggle your mind? Oh, the things that the Lord has to keep track of. One thing, for instance, in our gospel today, what were those disciples supposed to do when they entered the little town on the way to Jerusalem? Okay, we've got to go and tie the colt and the donkey. Then we have this line to say to anyone who might interrupt us, and Jesus said they're not going to argue with us. We're just going to take that colt, then we're going to throw our clothes on the donkey, then we're going to parade him through Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. You get something like this for Monday Thursday as they go and follow, oddly enough, a man with a jar on his head, and they follow him to, his, to the upper room where they will celebrate. But I've also been making a little list of little lists in the Bible that God keeps track of. For instance, the number of the hairs on your head, which may not be quite so many as yesterday or a few years ago. Or in Psalm 56, we're told by the psalmist that the Lord keeps track of his tears. When you think about that, God keeps track of your tears. Another one, the list of sins in Psalm 22, the prophetic psalm of Jesus on the cross, the list of sins that Jesus could count on his bones as he suffered for us. Or in uh, Matthew chapter 10, when all the 72 come back from doing these miraculous signs in the name of Jesus, he tells them, rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. Just think about the list of names in heaven. The books of judgment in Daniel 12 as they're opened, the book of life, as well as the record of sins. What other lists would you throw into that little list of lists that God keeps track of? And as you think about all the things that God keeps track of, we've got a little list here in Psalm 87, which only grows as the psalm progresses says it three times in this psalm, this one or that one or the other one is born in Zion. Hey, look, that person is born in Zion. That person, this person is born in Zion. It's one of those glorious things that God gives to Zion to say. And it's one of those lists maybe that we don't think of automatically when we wonder how God keeps track of all that he keeps track of. Um, there's, there is a list of one in this psalm as well. It's the places where you can worship the true God. In the Old Testament, that was only one place where you would offer sacrifices, I should say, to the true God. And that was the temple of God in this place known as Jerusalem with the call word of Zion for the people. That was the pride and joy of this nation, was their temple on the mountain. So what the Lord invites us to do as we read Psalm 87 is to consider ourselves a sacred list keeper. Just imagine if you went through Zion, if you went through this beautiful city on the mountainside, and it was your job to tally all those who are known by the Lord. As the psalm progresses, that's exactly what happens. There's someone with a stylus and ledger who goes through 
and talks to people and lists up, lists out who was born in Zion. And then you see another list. You see a list of five different nations. The first one might be confusing because there's an Old Testament lady um, who's later praised in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, named Rahab. But that's not what Psalm 87 is talking about. When it says Rahab, it's talking about this figurative dragon sometimes is used for Egypt. So there's Egyptians there. There's also Babylonians there in Zion. There's also Philistines and people from Tyre, apparently, as well as people from Cush, which we would say is Ethiopia. So we've got a list of five Gentile nations. And you might wonder why these ones are included. Well, you've got Babylon that ultimately, when entering Jerusalem, attacked from the north. You've got Egypt that threatened from the south. Known enemies, great big enemies of Israel. Then you've got closer neighbors orbiting the nation of Israel. You've got Philistia on the southern coast, this seafaring people, and you've got the Phoenicians of Tyre on the northern coast with their commerce and trade. And then you've got this sort of exotic, distant, far out land known as Cush, which we might identify as Ethiopia. And all these people are in Zion. That's what the list keeper notices. Surprised to find out, well, well, this is a Cushite, this is a Phoenician, this is someone from Egypt, but at the same time, this one's, this one's born in Zion. And this one was born in Zion. And this one was born in Zion. And that one. And how, how could that possibly be? And it doesn't take you too long to realize that what God is painting before us and for our list is not a physical picture of people who are established in that city, but a spiritual picture of those who have been converted into the city of Zion which turns out not to be a city where you can say here it is or, or there it is, but those who are converted to the faith of this God of Israel. What we have in Psalm 87 is this beautiful little psalm, but a foreshadowing picture of the New Testament and what God's church looks like. You've got people from nearby. You've got Gentiles from far away. You've got our old enemies. And you've maybe even got a reason to throw in some people from other nations that aren't included on this list. As you go throughout Zion, so let's say as you go throughout heaven someday, and you go and you look and you see people, you're not going to see just people of Jewish descent, are you? You're going to see the neighbors of Israel. You're going to see the distant, exotic, um, mysterious lands from afar. You're going to see former enemies of God all over the place. You're going to see Gentiles. You're going to see Americans and you're going to see Hoosiers. And you're going to be able to say, this one was born in Zion. And that one was born in Zion. And this, that, and the other one was born in Zion. Just as I look out today, you could look around and say, well, that person was born in Zion. That person was born in Zion. Because what we're talking about is not a physical descent or a bloodline that came through in order to reach you. We're talking about a spiritual rebirth in Psalm 87. And you know how this was literally fulfilled. If, if you've paid attention to the New Testament and the sequel to the Gospels, Acts chapter 2, you know that there were people from these nations as well as many others where we saw this play out in real time. The apostles were given that opportunity to speak the means of grace to these people, to give them the word, to give them baptism, and people from all over the place, even people from Rome who could take the word back and start a church there. And just as surely as St. Paul could appeal to his citizenship in Rome, so all those people who heard and believed on the day of Pentecost and forward could appeal to their citizenship in heaven and know that they belong in Zion. Over and over again, people from these other nations, whether princes or paupers, whether male or female, whether slave or free, whether queen or common or king or criminal, all are invited to this nation. For many are called, but few are chosen. And here we are at the beginning of Holy Week to rejoice in that fact once again. To know that in this bittersweet moment, we can hail the King of Kings and say, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But you also 
wring your hands and mourn and beat your chest because of the sins that brought him to this point. That the Holy Son of God would have to die for me. That, that the Almighty Father in heaven would keep me on his list and track me and record me and know by Psalm 87 to say this one was born in Zion. Even me. And even you. And so God's church today sings and jumps for joy over God's salvation in Christ and over new members who receive that salvation by faith. And we have this beautiful closing verse, verse 7, that gives us another glorious thing to say in Zion. It says, All my springs are in you, O Zion, in the city of God, in the Lord's congregation, are these fountains of grace, the truest fountains, known as God's word and, and his sacraments. And it's in these fountains, in these springs of Zion, that sinners are washed and made clean. It's in these living waters that we drink deeply in order to know God's grace and to be able to trust that this is a God who won't forget us on his ledger and who hasn't left our names off of the list. A living water that bubbles over and invites you to partake of all of the riches of his salvation and all of the sure hope of heaven. In these springs, God pours out his grace. In these springs, God pours out his Holy Spirit so intimately connected with the word that you can't separate him or expect him to work otherwise than the words off the pages of Scripture. God sees to it that the work of the church is not in vain as he sends them out to share his name. This prophecy is fulfilled today when we think of where Kira was born. We don't say, well, she was born in this place in, in Indiana or anything. We say today about a kingdom that is from another place. We say this one was born in Zion. There's no other place to really be reborn. And Jesus could say it even more clearly to us than that. It's, it's impossible to enter the kingdom of heaven except by rebirth in water and the Spirit. And we praise him for that free gift and we thank him as we say once again, Hosanna. Now, you may have a checklist of things to get done. You may have checklist upon checklist and those checklists may haunt you and they may crush you because they may be checklists having to do with the most mundane things or it may be checklists of things you have to get done at work or among the home to get ready for whatever Easter brings you, this special holiday or spring break as you consider your vacation. It may be a checklist as the new baby approaches or now that the new baby has been born. It may be a checklist of sins that you want to defeat or of good works that you want to complete. And you come in here dragging that checklist behind you as if this is the thing that saves you. Brothers and sisters, you need to know today as you go away that the Lord of checklists, the book of life himself, Jesus Christ, says, leave that at the cross. With all the palms and with all the beautiful things, leave all the ugly things and know that I keep the checklist that matters most, that, that is the most important. And by the way, there are some things that God does refuse to list you see, lately I've also been making a, a checklist, a little list of unlisted items in the Bible. How about all those unrighteous acts that are not counted against those who trust in Jesus Christ by faith? Ever since Genesis 15, we knew that in the life of Abraham. How about the record of wrongs that selfless agape love doesn't keep in 1 Corinthians 13? How about the list of hidden faults that we can't recount in our confession of sins, just like David says in Psalm 19? How about those hidden sins that we'd like God to forget? And he answers that request in grace when we confess to him. How about the written record that was canceled at the cross, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14? How convenient God has decided not to list those things it would take a monumental redemptive act like Jesus' death at the cross, 
and the blood of God himself to erase and blot out those things from the mind of God. And it's exactly that. It's exactly that kind of glorious thing that members of Zion are taught to say. From the very beginning when they're born in Zion to the point of self-awareness recognizing that all my springs, all my fountains are in the city of God and to that moment when he receives us in glory in heaven forever. In Jesus' name, amen.